So the seven leadings of God, lesson one, introduction to the seven leadings of God. So this is lessons from my pastor, of course, Pastor Chris McMichael, and a grafted word. But I found it as we were wrapping up godly parenting, I wanted to get us into something that would really help benefit us as we you know, talk a lot about, you know, especially me as a pastor and as a minister, talk a lot about being led by God, what that entails, and try to cover it the best I can in services, but to, because I'm usually trying to come at it from another angle, another teaching, another lesson, something of that nature. I don't have a lot of time to bog down on that in the moment. So when I come across this, I was like, all right, Lord, we'll, we'll teach on this. We'll bog, be able to bog down for a few weeks and exactly what that means. So when we discuss it, maybe in other services on a you know, Sunday morning or a Thursday night, we can refer back to these lessons in our heart and our mind or even come back to them physically to these pages and be able to look at that and understand it in a better manner. So in recent times, being led by the Holy Spirit has been a very needful and popular message among the church in general and Pentecostals in particular. This message was needful in order to improve the Christian's accuracy in service to Christ and to help prolong their life. So if we notice here, I love how pastor puts that. He says, it's helped us to improve the Christian's accuracy in service. Because you could be aiming at something, but unless your spot, unless you truly hone in on it and you've got your sights fixed according to the way they're supposed to be, you may be getting close, but you're not dead on accurate. So in the military especially, they taught us how to adjust our sights that we could hone in exactly and hit the bullseye. And that's what we want to do as Christians. We don't want to just you know, get on target. We don't just want to get, hit the paper. We want to be able to hit a bullseye. Now, we're human. We're not going to hit a bullseye every single time, like 10 out of 10. But when it comes to anything with God, we want to be as accurate as possible. Amen. So even being led by God, we want to be accurate. Because I have a dear friend of mine who has, we've ministered together and done things in the past, a, year, a few years ago now. But because he let his sights loosen up to some degree, according to what we're, where we're going to be talking about in these lessons especially, the, his leadings of Christ began to become a familiar spirit. What I firmly believe was once a, a one-and-done leading of God to say, hey, warn your people because he is a pastor. Warn your people of this and prepare for this. Well, it began to gain him notoriety and fame and to some degree, even though he still is against sin and things of that nature, it became to be the path that took him way out in left field. And the more that he gave in to that, the more he listened to it, the more it started to steer him, and he quit listening to the Word in, 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 in its entirety and began to quit listening to others that were trying to warn him, hey, brother, listen, you need to be careful with this, you need to be careful with this. And then now he's way out in left field, and he thinks everybody that is against him is completely wrong and he's right with God and nobody else is right. That's dangerous. That should say, that's a red flag. If you think you're the only one right with God and all these other people that are wrong with God, that's a sign. You need to say, mm, maybe I need to check this out. Maybe I need to listen closely to what they're saying and take it truly before God. So even I, along with many other ministers, pastors and things of that nature, we tried to warn this dear brother, but because his leadings were off, now he's in left field and I can't fellowship with him. I can't be in ministry with him because that's how far off he's gotten off track. So another reason why that we teach these lessons is so we can be accurate in what we're doing, but not only be accurate once or twice, but to remain accurate. Amen. So, but... With all, as with all doctrines and teaching, is, it has grown in desperate need of pruning because people will begin to take these and be led by goosebumps. They'd be led by other things and they add to this list, but there's seven true leadings of God. So these lessons have been written with the intention of pruning, tweaking, and reasserting how we as Christians are to be led by God, not just the Holy Spirit. Now notice, we're not just to be led by the Holy Spirit, we're to be led by God. And of course, we know the Trinity, that does include the Holy Spirit. But many people will, 
will rely on just the Holy Spirit and leave God out of it. Well, to do that, that means you've got to leave God's Word, you've got to leave Jesus Christ, you've got to leave so many other things that are still of God just to follow what you think is the Holy Spirit. So God's not going to contradict Himself. So if it's truly the Holy Spirit, it's not going to contradict the Word. It's going to line itself up with it. Because the Word is inspired and written by, penned by men but written by the Holy Spirit, which is God. Amen. So in the beginning, it must be pointed out that not every Christian believes that God still speaks. I'm going to say that again because the more I get around you know, people outside of our circle, so to speak, not just Abundant Grace Church, but kind of outside of our non-denominational circle, I hear this more and more. So it must be pointed out that not every Christian believes that God still speaks. So what good is he as a God if he doesn't speak to his people? That's like, you know, what kind of leader doesn't speak to his people? That's why the president addresses the nation so many times or has a representative address the nation so many times is because he puts out there, of course, with this current administration, they try to not put him out in front of the people as much as they can. They try to get other people to do that. Anyway, but you hear from that office a lot so that people understand what's going on to some degree, or at least what they want you to understand. But if God was the same way, he would be unjust to say, all right, I'm going to lead you, but I'm not going to talk to you. Much like, you know, a man of the house, he used to lead his family, he's to lead his wife, so he's got to communicate. And he's got to be accurate in his communication and to be clear in his communication. So any leader needs to communicate to their people. So God is going to still speak to his people because he's still leading us. So sadly, these Christians are ignorant. They're not stupid. They're ignorant. So ignorant means you, don't, you haven't learned that yet or you've put it aside. You may not want to hear it. It's not just that you haven't heard it. It's You may not have heard it, but more than likely with Christians of this nature, they don't want to hear it. No, 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 I'm not listening to you. Well, how can God speak to you if you don't want to listen to him? Or how can you accurately walk with God if you're not reading his word? Because that's his manual. That's his, his, his owner's manual for our Christian life. To us to know him, to be able to have an accurate relationship with him. So if you don't read that, you will be ignorant. So sadly, these Christians are ignorant and may render themselves of little benefit to the kingdom. Beginning with the creation of Adam and Eve... God demonstrated his desire to fellowship, communicate, God command, and help mankind. He has a desire to do so, because that's who God is. He wants to fellowship with his people. He wants to fellowship with his creation, being mankind. But it's up to us to be able to accept that invitation to walk with him and to be with him. But he has that desire. So the Lord walked and talked with Adam and Eve. God's fellowship with man included blessings, commands, assignments, and corrections. So notice it's not just a blessing. You don't just get your blessing on. There's also commands that come with that. There's also assignments and corrections. So Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them. That's where many people want to stop, right there. And God blessed them. Give me my blessing, Lord. No, no, no. You're to walk with God. You're to talk with Him. And if you're led by Him, that's when the blessing comes. And God said unto them, notice God spoke, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. There's a lot of commands right there. (laughs) And have dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God's will could only be accomplished if He first revealed it to Adam and then gave him his assignment. So God blessed them first, then he gave them five commands. Number one is be fruitful. Number two is multiply. Number three is replenish. Number four is subdue. And number five is is have dominion. So notice the fifth one is the dominion. The fifth one is the authority. Amen. So God set divine boundaries and parameters for man and then communicated them to him. Amen. Let me read that again. 
So God set divine boundaries and parameters for man and then communicated them to him. So notice God sets boundaries. He doesn't just say, oh, now you're free. You're free to go anywhere you want to, do anything you want to. That's not the way God operates. God says, this is where you need to stay. This is your safety net because it will keep you safe. Amen. And, you know, that's like, you know, we let our boys you know, run around in the backyard and play, but we're looking into getting a fence because we know that will provide protection and safety. So that way a ball doesn't, you know, go out the uh, in one side of our, our backyard and go out into the road. So that will provide safety. Well, it won't, you know, it'll also keep the boys in on this side from maybe hitting our neighbor's house if they're playing ball or doing something. That provides safety. So we see that when God sets boundaries, he sets parameters, it's for us to be safe. Not because he's a meanie weenie. It's because he wants to keep us safe. Because he loves us. Amen. But notice, he also communicates those boundaries and those parameters. Because if he didn't, he would be an unjust God. That's like when you, when you have, you know, we'll take a classroom because we know school starting back. The teacher's going to go over the classroom rules to say, we don't chew gum in class, we don't do this, we don't do that. And if they didn't, if, if the teacher did not go over that, then all of a sudden on the second or third day, why are you chewing gum in here? Well, I didn't know we couldn't chew gum. Well, you're in detention. Well, that's not fair because they didn't know the rule, didn't know it wasn't accurately communicated, so how can they expect to live by those guidelines? So God specifically gives us the Word of God, puts His Holy Spirit out there for us to be able to interact and to learn, to have things of God revealed to us, but He puts those parameters and boundaries, and then He communicates them to us so that He is a just God, so that we understand His expectation. God cannot righteous, righteously judge if He does not first communicate His expectations. This is highly, just to take a little bit of a side, side note, this is highly important to when you're courting and about to get married. You need to put the expectations out there. Amen. <laughs> because if you start courting somebody, then all of a sudden you get married and, all, and there's expectations that maybe one of the spouses now have that weren't communicated beforehand. Now the other one's set up for failure because they didn't know that was going to be an expectation. That's like, you know, any time that I preach and, you know, we have different people kind of come and go, I'm not going to fluff up anything just because, you know, we have somebody new or because, you know, whatever a different situation is. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let you know straight up front, I preach the word. I try to stick to it as best as I can. I'm still a man. I may not be 100% accurate, but I try to be at least 95, 98% accurate. But I try to be led by God. So that we, I, put out, I put out the expectation of this is how I preach. This is how I minister. And either you're called here or you're not. So that way the expectation is there. So we're on the same page. So God does the same thing. So if I, want, if I declare I'm, I want to be like God, I want to be like Jesus Christ, that he's our ultimate example and he did the same thing because he didn't fluff any message. He met the people of where they had need of. Some people needed healing, so he would minister on that. Some people needed to be set free from sin, so he ministered on that. So he would teach whatever the, the situation was, and that was the expectation. Amen. So Genesis 1, 29, 30b, 2, 16, and 17, kind of combine them all here, says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat or food. I have given every green herb for meat, food, and it was so. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So notice, God gave him liberty... But then he set a boundary. He said, you can have liberty, you can have freedom, as long as you're in this boundary, as long as you're in this parameter. So we clearly see that God's will from the beginning was to fellowship with man and to communicate with him. It is a blessing anytime God speaks to man. It is a blessing. 
But divine leadings and fellowship also involve commands, assignments, corrections, and help. (laughs) If you feel like God's always just encouraging you and just giving you your best Tuesday ever, you might want to question, what's wrong with me? Does God think I'm just a spiritual mm, pansy, so to speak? That I just need to encourage me all the time? So what's wrong with me if God's having to encourage me all the time? Because if it's just like a, just like we'll say a, a hireling pastor, he will encourage the people all the time, oh, you're so good, God loves you, oh, you... And he'll do that. Why? Because he's cheating the people of following the commands of God. So it almost begs the question of what does that pastor really think of those sheep? What does that pastor really think of those people if he can't put a a demand on them to serve their God? Of just trying to encourage them, fluff them up. What's he wanting out of them? Because a good salesman will make you feel good before he dives in to make you buy something. So what is that hireling of a pastor or minister trying to do to the congregation if all he's doing is buttering them up? What's he want out of them? Because it's not a walk from God. A walk with God is not what he's wanting. Because that requires to, of course, encourage you, build you up, but also put a demand on you. To say, walk with your God. Know your God. Know the Bible. Pray to God. Be here in church. Do what God has called you to do. So that's the, that's the command that God has for all of us. You notice even the Great Commission says, Go ye, not sit ye. Go ye, therefore, and preach. Go ye, therefore, make disciples. Go ye, and do this, do that. It's not a just, well, you just come to church, and we'll just butter you up, take your money, and then you can leave. No. It's also, <laughs> they don't, Encourage people just to come and have coffee and donuts. That's not the way God works. Amen. Amen. I don't care how popular it becomes. The only time we'll do that is after service at the fellowship hall that we have. That's the only time we'll have coffee and donuts. Amen. (laughs) Because this is God's sanctuary. This is where we come to to meet with our God. And we know that He's everywhere. We can be with Him anywhere. But this is a sanctified, set-apart room, house of God, that we can come and say, this is holy ground. That we come before our God to lift up our hands, to lift up our voices, and to hear the Word of God. Amen. So it's a blessing that any time God speaks to man, but divine leadings and fellowship also also involve commands, Assignments, corrections, and help. Why would we expect the heart of God to be any different today? Because if God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then He's not going to change. He's going to expect the same thing. So we all believe that we are to have a relationship with God and that we are to enjoy fellowship with the Lord, but neither of those, neither of these exist without two way communication. So you've got to be able to two-way communicate. You communicate with God, He communicates with you. Just any relationship, a marriage, you can't have a one-sided communication. If you have a one-sided communication in your marriage, you don't have a relationship. All you got is a piece of paper that says you're legal roommates and you can have sex together. You don't have a relationship. If you have a relationship, you'll both talk to each other. You have an actual relationship. The same goes with God. To have an actual relationship with Him, you communicate to Him. He's not your sugar daddy. He's not your genie. But then He communicates with you and says, All right, if you want this blessing, seek ye first the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. Yes, sir. Amen. The seven leadings of God. New Testament, born-again believers have been given more tools and abilities when it comes to being led by God. We are a blessed people (laughs) we have so much more than king david did than saul than in anybody in the old testament we are spoiled when it comes to being christians amen our lives ought to be the most god glorifying gospel reflective wisdom defined truth lived decision accurate lives in the history of mankind (laughs) notice the word ought doesn't mean that it is. We ought. It's our choice. Drill Sergeant Odom. It's a choice day, privates. 
If we choose correctly, we will. But we, so we ought to be. <laughs> That's like when you're given the option between a V8 and a V6. Which one would you, which one would you rather have? I'm going to take the V8 any day. If I'm given the choice in a vehicle between, we'll say, a four-cylinder, six-cylinder, or a V8, I'm going to pick the V8. Just because it's got more horsepower, I know that there's more to it. Yes, it may drink a little, little bit more gas, but when I need the power, it's there and at my foot. That's like, why, why serve God barely like a four-cylinder or the six-cylinder, which is just a glorified four-cylinder? Or you can have the full throttle of God at your disposal because He's given you authority, He's given you power, He's given you dominion. Because remember, God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but He gives us power. That's the first thing mentioned. But He also gives us love and a sound mind to finish that verse out. But if we want the full things of God, we've been given that. So why choose only part of the things of God? We, receive, we should want it to receive everything that God has for us, so we choose the V8, the power of God, to say, all right, Lord, I need this in my life. I really need your help, so help me. But Lord, you know I'm called to do anything that you want me to do. That's that submission to put the seatbelt on and say, all right, Lord, wherever you want to go, you lead me, you guide me, you steer this vehicle And Lord, I'll push on the gas knowing that when I need to speed up, I've got the power of God endorsing me because you're leading the way. Amen. Amen. So the remainder of these lessons will focus on the seven leadings of God. We will briefly introduce the seven leadings here. So we'll do like a quick overview for the rest of this lesson, but then we'll dive into each of them each week. So number one, the Holy Scriptures. I love how my pastor does this because this is by design, and we would say this is probably the most available to us, is the Holy Scriptures. That should be the first thing that we go to. The Scriptures are the primary way God communicates to us today. The primary, the very basic best thing that we have for us. Because sometimes we can pray and we feel like we don't get an answer. Sometimes we we go to somebody and maybe they don't give us an answer. But the Word of God is always there and will always give us an answer. But here's the key. (laughs) Sometimes we don't want to accept what the Word says. Well, that doesn't, that's not the way I want to hear that, God. God says, I don't care. It's what my Word says. It's what I put out there for you years ago, long before you were ever born, long before your mom and daddy was ever born. I had this written for you to give you your answer. So don't argue with me. Look at the Word of God, submit to it, and live your life by it. So New Testament believers have been afforded the written Word of God in a form not available to man for 4,600 years. New, early New Testament believers had only the Old Testament. The New Testament was written over a period of about 60 years after the ascension of Christ. Consider what God says about His Word. So here's the importance of God's Word to God. So to hear anybody say, well, we don't need to read the Old Testament. Well, the Word of God has errors in it. It's no longer for today. That is hogwash. That is junk, and that is heresy. The Word of God is infallible. It has no errors. It is culturally relevant from the beginning of time to today. Now, by culturally relevant, I don't mean that culture abides by it. It is what our culture should line up with. Amen. But you'll find that the culture of today has taken a hard left turn away from anything that has to do with God. I think about, you know, as perverted as even the things of God as the rainbow. God did not institute a rainbow for gay pride, for any homosexuality. He instituted as a promise of, I won't flood the earth again. So what was a promise unto God's people for eternity now has been perverted for any homosexual to wave their little flag and say that they're right in their own eyes and that you have to accept it. No, I don't have to accept it. I, I accept that you need Jesus Christ as your Savior and to forgive and be forgiven of your sins. That's what I accept. Amen. But here's what God says about His Word. So this is how important God's Word is to Him. 
Psalm 119, 89 says, His word is forever settled under heaven. That means you can't argue with it. You can argue till you're blue in the face. It's not going to change the word of God. I will warn you. I thought about this the other day. You know, because I use my phone when I, you know, if I'm out and about, I don't have a Bible right on me. I'll look it up. I'll look up scripture. I'll do things. And, and I thought, you know what? How deceptive, how deceptive the enemy can be because many people will use that. They don't, they get away from their printed Bible. And, and I'm, I'm not knocking that, but how deceptive, how easily could the enemy tweak? Because, oh, oh, you, you want to read the Bible, huh? Well, let's, let's spin some of these scriptures technologically to where they really don't line up with what that says. And if people don't know the word of God, they won't even notice. Or if everybody be, begins to have a heavy... Uh, they rely heavily on their technology for the Word of God, what's to say that they don't shut it off one day? Oh, this is a Christian app. Delete. This is no longer going to work. Now you're left with what? Nothing. Now, so, so again, I'm not knocking that technology because I use it quite a bit. I use it to look up different things, to have it handy if I'm, if I'm out at like, you know, Walmart, if I have a scripture and I want to make notes or something, I pull it up. But we need to make sure we have a printed Bible that we can always refer to because the words on that's not going to change. When it was printed, it's not going to change. Amen. So that way you have something you can always go to. And so no, no matter what technology wants to do, no matter what culture wants to do, they can shut down all the apps. We still got the word of God because it's forever settled. So his word is magnified above his name. It's magnified above. That means God puts more emphasis on his word than even his name. That's powerful. Psalm 138.2. His word is more pure than silver tried seven times. Psalm 12.6. That's been tried. His word is truth. John 17.17. 17. His word, the scriptures, is God-breathed, and they are good for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16. So notice they're God-breathed, but they're good for doctrine, which means how you live your life. They're good for reproof, making sure you know what's right to show you. They're good for correction, making the adjustments that you have need of, and good for instruction in righteousness, how to live your life once again. The instruction, the, the manual of righteousness. His word is the seed of our salvation. It lives and abides forever and endures forever. 1 Peter 1, 23-25. Notice it's the seed of our salvation. And it lives and abides forever. That means it's not going to end. It's there forever. Forever. <laughs> so Jesus is the word made flesh. John 1, 14. So Jesus was so important, the Word so important that, that the Bible describes Him, God describes Jesus as the Word made flesh. So the Holy Scriptures are a source of leading that requires time, discipline, and mental comprehension. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Scriptures are a source of leading that requires time, discipline, and mental comprehension. That means you just can't, you know, Take the word, oh, that's the word of God, okay. No, you got to, it takes time to read it. It takes time to study it. It takes discipline. <laughs> there, there's times I, I go to sit down and read, then I get a phone call. I go to sit down and read, then one of the boys say, hey, Daddy, can you help me with this? I go to sit down and read, and then something on my job pops up. I go to sit down and read, and you see, it takes discipline. But if you give up, you, you sit down, and all of a sudden something comes up, well, I'll get to that later. I get to that later. I get to that later. Next thing you know, it's been years since you've actually sat down and studied and read the Word of God. It takes discipline. Amen. But I will say this. We can't neglect the things of life also just to be in the Word 24-7. We've got to be careful that we balance things out. Because God expects us to know the Word, but He also expects us to put our hand to things. To be good stewards over our lives and everything that we have. But it takes mental comprehension. Don't just read it without comprehending what it says. So number two, the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the principal thing. God's word is the epitome of wisdom. His spirit is called the spirit of wisdom. 
Many times we don't need to pray and fast as much as we need to ask, what does wisdom say? Or what is the wise, a wise thing to do? Amen. You know, sometimes people will fast and they'll pray, and I'm going to throw this in there as well. People will fast and pray and try to seek God on things without going to His Word or without seeking wisdom. Now, is praying and fasting a bad thing? No, not at all. But when you go to that, rather than studying or rather than using wisdom of God, because we know that the Word will bring wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, so if we use all of these things together, we'll receive our answer and have the leading of God. But many times people want the quick solution or the easy solution of just, all right, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need that, I need wisdom for this, I need wisdom for that. Well, what's the Word say about it? Well, what does wisdom say about it? So we can use both of those. Studying and knowing the Bible will automatically grow wisdom in your life. I'm going to say that again. Studying and knowing the Bible will automatically grow wisdom in your life. So if you follow the first one, it will bring the second one. If you follow number one, which is the Holy Scriptures, it will automatically deposit within you number two that you can go back and refer to. But the Holy Spirit is our remembrancer. He brings back to memory the things that we have read, the things that we've heard. But how can He bring back anything that you haven't read or haven't heard or, or wasn't a part of? There's been quite a few times I've preached a message that the Lord gave me and that's for that service, but the person I knew would have benefited from, they weren't there. So how can you bring back to memory something that, that you weren't there for? Or something you haven't read because you don't take time for the Word. Sometimes wisdom is crying out so loudly, prayer isn't necessary at all. So wisdom, that's not to say that you don't pray. That's to say that it's already speaking loudly enough to you that you should be able to hear it without really having to dive deep in prayer. So wisdom is a source of leading based on the Scripture's experience and mental comprehension. So number three, and of course we'll talk about that in another lesson more in depth. Number three, the peace of God. The peace of God as a source of leading is the first source of leadership that begins to leave man's mental realm. This is the first one that begins to leave your, your we'll say your brain, so to speak, where you don't have to put thought into it. The peace of God is a peace that passes all understanding. There's been times we've started to do something and my peace left me. The peace of God left me and I said, all right, we, we're not doing this. We got to, whatever we were about to do, we got to stop because I don't have peace about it. And nine times out of ten, it's always been accurate. Maybe the, maybe the tenth one was, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe I was having indigestion or had, you know, something like that. I don't know. I don't know what to chalk the tenth one up to, but nine times out of ten, it was because the Lord was saying, don't do this, don't follow through with this. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> but by definition, it will usually bypass our mental faculties and even defy them. There's been times we've started to do something. You know, we'll, we'll, I'll use the example of moving back from the military. When we started to leave the military, I didn't have a job lined up. We didn't really have a house lined up. We didn't have anything lined up. All we knew was God said go, and we said yes, sir. So that, but we had peace. It wasn't like we were completely scared and just in fear. We said, all right, Lord. In the natural, this doesn't make sense, but to us spiritually, it makes sense. So we're going with peace. We had peace about it. So we came back. Everything fell in line. We wound up having a house right, I mean, right before we moved. So... That, that worked out. God blessed me with, with jobs and took care of us. And peace was there. So it was, it was brought to fruition because of that peace. So Isaiah 55, 12 declares that we will be led forth with peace. Amen. So number four is the Holy Spirit. Notice, I love how, how my pastor has done this. Number four is the Holy Spirit. It's not the number one. Number one was a scripture. That was the first and foremost. Because even the Word begins to say, when prophecies fail, which prophecies what? Of the Spirit. Because there's still that element of mankind to it. So you, we may even 
hear what we want to hear out of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit say, you know, may say, well, you know, I need you to move to Montana. We'll just throw that out there. Well, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I get to move to Montana. We'll say he says to go to Montana. All right, oh, I get to move to Montana, get start my new job, start a ministry out there. That's not what he said. He said, go to Montana. Maybe the Holy Spirit meant on vacation. Maybe the Holy Spirit said to go out there and to witness to somebody. But me, being a man, would hear, oh, I get to go out there for this. I get to go out there for that. That's the way mankind works. If we're not careful, we interpret the things of God with our own mind or our own understanding, and we hear and see what we want out of it. But we need to be accurate in in that. So the Scripture is more accurate, and we can rely on that and build doctrine on that. So the Holy Spirit comes number four. Not saying that it's not important, but in order of secession, we need to make sure that we also know the Word of God because when we hear the Holy Spirit say something or rightly divide something in our life, we're able to judge it by the Word of God to say, all right, that's accurate. That lines up with the Word. Now we know if we're, if we're accurate because there are many spirits out there and none of them and all of them are, are without signification. So that means they all have a voice. They're all going to say something. They're all from somewhere But there are multiple spirits. So we've got to judge things. And if we judge a spirit that we hear, if we judge it by the word of God, we'll know whether it's the Holy Spirit or another spirit. Because even, you know, as as the word tells us, that the, the enemy, Satan, tries to pass himself off as an angel of light. He tries to pass off as something good, but he's really not. He's the he's a liar and the father of lies. So We need to judge it. But if we don't know the word of God, we can't rightly judge it. So as with many doctrines and teachings, the the church tends to generalize and lump subjects when the scriptures exhort us to rightly divide. So this is the same with the leadings of God. We tend to classify all divine leadings as being led by the Holy Spirit. These lessons will help us to rightly divide these seven leadings. Being led by the Holy Spirit is supernatural and divine. Praise God. Jesus called the Holy Spirit a guide into all truth and revealer of things to come. John 16, 13. He receives of the Lord's and reveals it unto us. Being led by the Holy Spirit is the will of God for every Christian. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying we neglect the Holy Spirit because we don't. But we, that is the will of God for every Christian. Because as we see here, Romans 8.14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we've got to be led by the Spirit to be a son of God. So it's important for us to be led by the Spirit. But to know, mm, yeah, that's the Holy Spirit because that lines up with Scripture. Uh, no, nah, that's not. No, nah, I know about three or four verses that contradict that. That's not God. That's somebody trying to fool me. Amen. So this can often be thought of as a still, small voice. And we'll, of course, talk about that in another lesson. Number five, preachers, the oracles of God. I've placed preachers, being my pastor's written this, I've placed preachers after the Holy Spirit for two reasons. Number one, every believer has been given the Holy Spirit to be with us always. So the Holy Spirit goes wherever you go. Amen. Amen. But the preacher isn't always with us. It's true. I'm not, I can't always be there to watch over you. No matter you know, how many people get paranoid and think because I'm also a private investigator or whatever, they think, oh, he's watching me. He's watching me. He's everywhere I go. No, that's not the case. I've got my own life to live. I've got things I've got to do. <laughs> Amen. So I can't always be with you. Now, he or she is only with us a few times a week at best. And number two... Any good preacher or pastor wants the sheep to be more dependent upon the Spirit of God than himself or herself. That is my desire. I want you to be more dependent on him than me. Because when it comes down to it, when we, when we, either when we're raptured or when our lives come to an end and we just said we're, we're all done with this race, we're all done, we're ready to go home to heaven, you're going to have to stand before God And you can't say, well, Pastor Caleb was my pastor. I'm relying on his faith. That's not how it's going to work. He's going to say either he knows you or he doesn't. So it's best to know him now to be dependent on him 
and to walk with Him for yourself. Amen. We want you to know your God better than you know us. Amen. It's like, I want to know every one of y'all, and I hope that y'all you know, know me, because you know I love y'all, and hopefully y'all love me. We're all called to, to work in the body together, but I want you to know Him more than you know me. Amen. It, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes I'll think, you know, what would Pastor Chris do? And then I'm like, then I kind of feel convicted in myself. I'm like, why did I say that? Why wouldn't I say, what would God do? Well, to me, that, that is my example lived out before me. Not that he's perfect because he's still a man, but I know that, my, that God has ordained him to be in my life, so that's my natural example that my mind goes to. So I know that if he's following God, and like Paul said, I follow God as I follow him, then everything's going to work out together. But our first, we should know God more than we know our pastor or other spiritual leaders in our life. As 1 John 2.27 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth, teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. So remember that faith comes by hearing the word of God preached. So now notice when this says that you have no man, you have need that no man teach you, that means you can be taught by the Holy Spirit. But we've, as I've also taught actually on this specific topic as well, when we were covering 1 John, that doesn't mean that we negate being in the house of God. We don't negate being with our gift from Jesus Christ, the fivefold ministers. So we, we need both, but we don't have to rely as the Old Testament people did. They didn't have to go to the temple to hear the rabbi teach, and then he put away the scroll, and that was it. That was the only access anybody had. We now have multiple access points. We have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have so much, as we discussed earlier, we are so much, we're so spoiled and so blessed that we need to know God and use the other resources as well. So, but, but preached by whom? By God's preacher, his oracle, 1 Peter 4.11. Number six, the word of the Lord Jesus. The word of the Lord is spoken over 225 times in the Old Testament. It is usually in reference to the Lord, Jehovah, speaking to his servants, the prophets. It is, as much, it is a much more authoritative word or leading than in the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Though the Holy Spirit does speak to, to us on his behalf, on behalf of the Lord Jesus, John 16, 13, there are times when the Lord Jesus does things from his own authority, such as Paul's encounter on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, 3-6, Ananias' vision concerning Saul of Tarsus, Acts 9, 10-17, and Paul's commandment toward the married believers in 1 Corinthians 7, 10, to name a few. So number seven. Our final one, the supreme voice of God, the Father. The scriptures reveal that the utterances and declarations of God, the Father, are different in nature and occurrence than the Lord's or the Holy Spirit's. So notice, when God, the Father, speaks, this is one of those, you better listen. Because either he's directly giving you a command or telling you something, or you've neglected the other ones, and he's finally saying, this is your last chance. <laughs> so granted, they are the Trinity, one God, but three persons, but each member of the Trinity has a different role in operation concerning mankind. Consider the Lord's baptism by John. God, the Holy Spirit, came upon Jesus, the Son, as God the Father spoke from heaven. So you see all three working together. Also consider the Trinity's role in our self-intercession according to Romans 8, 26 and 27. Jesus searches our hearts, directing the purpose of the Holy Spirit as He, the Holy Spirit, intercedes for us according to the will of the Father. And finally, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all, of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. 
So having a relationship with the creator of all things means that you can expect to be led by him. Amen. So be prepared for an improved life as a Christian as we study the seven leadings of God. Amen.